role of the digital economy in rebuilding our economies post-COVID will be vital. However, we must also ensure that these technologies are safe for all. For this discussion, we are joined by two leading policymakers from opposite sides of the Atlantic to discuss how to build a better world. Please welcome to the stage Matthew Kaminsky of Politico, European Commissioner Vera Jourova, and United States Representative Stacey Plaskett. Great to have you both. Um, we all heard uh, Francis uh, Hoygen last night on this stage uh, talk about uh, Facebook, and, and obviously this has been the te biggest tech story of the last uh, month. And I, it brought my mind back that you know, only three years ago we had a Cambridge Analytica scandal. And it's been seven years since Max uh, Schrank sort of raised the privacy problems with our social media platforms. And I want to maybe start with you, Congresswoman, and say, is this different now? And what do you think can change? <clears throat> I think this is different now because members of Congress recognize that platforms like Facebook are not really just a platform, that they are actually a delivery system that can be utilized by outside organizations to effectuate people's emotions, people's outcomes, what people do. And so they're not just giving information, they're creating content and actions on the part of particularly American people. And the American people are reacting to that. And so they're having a fundamental shift in their thinking about what these platforms do, and what their content and what their purpose is. And that is driving members of Congress, like myself, to take a second look at how we regulate and how we utilize these platforms in our society. What do you think is the, let me just follow up there, what do you think is the most important change that Congress can enact? And maybe relatedly, what is most politically realistic? Mm. I think that in the American system, we're constrained by free trade. We're constrained by the notions of capitalism that allow the market to dictate what will be regulated and what will not. And innovation is difficult for members of Congress to keep up with and to utilize in a regulatory framework. And so I think what members have to understand is that it's our job to create uh, the barriers not necessarily to be inside each one of the details, but to create, in essence, a sandbox in which social media and other platforms, other technologies will play fair. You think, one last follow-up. Uh, Section 230, uh, is that your priority or should be the priority or is it something else? You know, obviously transparency around algorithms is what people are talking about here uh, this week. Well, for the European Union, our discussion is about privacy. And I'm sure the Vice President will have some thoughts about that. I think as well, what we're concerned about in the American system is misinformation as well. Um, incitement to destroy our democracy. And so whatever is necessary to ensure that the American experiment of democracy continues and allows for inclusion of ideas um, within the notion of free, free press and freedom of expression, members of Congress are going to. And I think we're also concerned with vulnerabilities of our, of our American people, youth, uh, misinformation going to different sectors of our, of our uh, country, whether it's to minorities, whether it's to uh, women specifically, the micro-targeting that goes on. Uh, for example, let me, one last thought. The January 6th Commission. While the January 6th Commission's main objective is to determine how did we potentially lose our democracy, how did an insurrection on our election take place? They are also going to be involved in recommendations for change. Part of that recommendation is how social media, how technology was utilized 
to bring an eventual, a perpetual coup against democracy itself. Vice President Yurova, uh, you were commissioner in the previous commission, now, now you're a vice president. And I remember that you were previously a proponent of not imposing hard restriction on platforms and preferring the route of self-regulation. Have you changed your mind? Obviously, because we have already adopted legislation uh, and I myself was accompanying it with uh, the phrase uh, that the time of gentleman agreements is over. But I don't want to uh, underestimate the impact, positive impact of the agreements we had against, uh, uh, through the code of uh, conduct against hate speech or code of practice against disinformation because for the time being it was an important quick arrangement because uh, when we uh, want to legislate in Europe it takes years but now we are in the stage of legislating we have in the process uh, the Digital Services Act which is quite a I would say a revolutionary set of rules and uh, as Stacey said, uh, in Europe, we, you didn't say we are obsessed about privacy, but <laughs> <laughs> we pay a lot of attention to protection of privacy. But now it's also about uh, security, uh, about protecting the elections, protecting the autonomous choice of people, protection of the rights of individuals. So that's why we shifted from gentleman agreements to legally binding rules which will be binding to all the actors on the digital market. Matt, Matt, can I ask, say something with regard to that? I think in the United States also, we have this tenuous um, balancing act, right? We want to have that, uh, we would love to have the gentleman's agreement. We would love to allow um, the free market to do what it needs to do. Because for America, as we were discussing, our, our means of growth is through innovation, through technology allowing to continue to change and to grow, and recognizing that regulations could hamper that. At the same time, we have to balance that with privacy, with the misuse of technology, and ensuring that government is there to protect people, while at the same time creating the incentives for technology to grow. President Obama famously said that the EU is unfairly targeting U.S. companies out of partly a sense of envy and uh, reflecting the inability of Europe to create its own tech giants. Mm. Uh, do you think he's still right? Uh, you know, I think that we come from very different perspectives. I would not say that it's envy. Uh, I understand that the European Union has a different genesis. Right? They have experiences which America is now just experiencing. Notions of totalitarian rule, of dictatorships, a Stasi, a Nazis, who utilize technology or utilize privacy to do very bad things against people. I think in the United States, prior to the last administration, the Trump administration, Obama would never have imagined that social media could be used as a weapon against government itself. And now, because we have that experience, I think there's a recognition that there needs to be some safeguards that are in place that allow technology to continue to innovate while at the same time protecting people, and protecting the system, the free market, and our society at large. Vice President, you mentioned uh, you know, the importance of privacy, and obviously Europe uh, passed GDPR with a lot of fanfare. I think it's generally acknowledged that enforcement has been problematic, if not a failure. And um, I, I wonder, as you're thinking through this Digital Services Act, are you giving thought to uh, changing who would be enforcing uh, some of the rules that you want to put in place? I guess the other way to put this is, can you trust Dublin to enforce this act better than it's enforced GDPR, or should the commission step in and think of a different enforcement mechanism? Hmm. As for Dublin, if you mean the data protection yes, authority, exactly. yeah. uh, of course, uh, there is a permanent issue of maybe the lack of capacities or maybe uh, the, the lack of money. I, I, I don't know uh, which is uh, problematic when you realize a big portion of work they have with the one 
stop shop uh, mechanism where really uh, a lot of big players are based in Ireland and they have to do the job. But for the Digital Services Act, we are not considering using the data protection authorities for the enforcement uh, of, of, the, of the new rules. Uh, it will be up to the member states to design or to, do, to define the, the enforcers. And definitely there will have to be um, a lot of attention to the capacities needed to do the oversight properly because there will be a lot of uh, new, new work. Be a bit more specific, who, do you, who will be the enforcers and uh, will be shared among the 27 countries of the EU or, or will one country be more important than others in terms of enforcing this? I would really love to see very well covered, uh, the, 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 this work well covered in all the member states. Uh, and I would even predict that the smaller countries with the languages which is spoken by a smaller number of people, there should be more effort to have well-functioning enforcer because uh, what we see already now on the code of practice and code of, of conduct that uh, uh, the smaller languages are, are underestimated and not served well. So who will be the enforcers? Now, now the debate is ongoing. The member states will have to define the, the enforcers and uh, I believe that uh, they will do it uh, with full responsibility uh, relevant to the magnitude of the issues we, we have to uh, cover. Let's talk about transatlantic relations uh, a bit, since we have you both on stage. You, you seem to get along well, but um, <laughs> it's clearly been difficult to reach a transatlantic consensus in recent years um, over how, uh, what kind of rules should be set for this digital world that we're living in. Um, maybe I may ask each of you, um, what is one thing that your side or your or your your side, I guess, sort of Europe and America, might have to concede on to uh, to really come together in a way that you that America and Europe have not? After all, there's not even a private sh shield deal in place. Mm. Uh, we have good perspective ahead of us, no? <laughs> because I think after some uh, time of uh, let's say partly frozen relations, so we, we you being know, kind. might start a new <laughs> chapter. Uh, I believe that uh, with the United States, we face the same problems uh, stemming from digital uh, development, and uh, we are based on the same set of values, and so we should maybe try to find uh, similar solutions. Sure. Not the same solutions, because as Stacy already indicated, there are different traditions, different experience from, from the history and so on. So there is a big, uh, I think, perspective uh, for, for doing more together. And I will not surprise you, Mr. Kaminsky, I will have to mention one thing, and it is the, the law on uh, protection of privacy which uh, would make our life on European side easier because we are giving the green light for transfers of a uh, big amount of private data to the United States. And uh, so we really desperately need to see equivalent uh, level of protection on American side, which is not what I am saying. This is what the European Court of Justice is saying that once we are transferring the data, private data of Europeans, the protection has to travel with the data and the protection has to be guaranteed on the other side. I don't know better solution than to have uh, good uh, uh, legal rules. Well, the Vice President just mentioned something that Europe would want, which is uh, America to sign up to a European style uh, uh, privacy protections. I wonder, uh, Congresswoman, what would America want uh, from Europe, specifically to your point, reassurances that uh, we're not going to drown, you know, these incredibly innovative companies in European style bureaucracy. Well, I don't know if um, we would call it bureaucracy. Uh, I think the protections that the European Union is requesting, and specifically the European Court, because we, as uh, in the negotiations of the Privacy Shield of 2020, 
That was the EU with the United States in agreement about what that should look like. It was the European Court which struck it down. I think that what we would request from them is an understanding of the opt-ins and specifically on the part of Americans, the opt-out. But I think that um, American lawmakers also recognize the economics and the need for us to come to some agreement. Presently in 2020, we recognize that about a quarter of a trillion dollars is exchanged in data transport between the EU and the United States. And recognizing with cryptocurrency, it is somewhere in the trillions that we may be missing by not having these agreements in place. And so I think that we would uh, ask for patience and as, as well for them to ease off uh, and the courts to understand the American system that allows us, one, to create, continue to create this innovation, while at the same time we internally are creating mechanisms for protection of individuals' good, you know, individuals' privacy rights at the same time. I think that we're going to come to an agreement. As you can see, America is moving forward in our engagement with the European Union, just as we have President Biden engaged right now at COP26 um, in Glasgow. I think that we'll come to some, some uh, agreement between all of us. One last question about, uh, and I'm gonna use a word that has not been mentioned here today, which is China. Uh, if Europe cannot agree with itself on China, how, uh, on a policy toward China, how optimistic are you that you can agree with the U.S. to on a, on an approach toward to transatlantic uh, 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 tech regulation and policy? Mm. I think that Europe is quite stable and transparent on what is the, our positioning towards China. Uh, we made very clear that there are things uh, or areas where we have to be uh, allies, which. I hope, could be in the field of climate. Uh, and uh, then there is a big area where we are competitors. And then there is a big area where we are rivals. And we have to do more to be protected against some technologies, especially technologies uh, produced in China, which might be in breach with how we understand the technology which serves the people and which does not, uh, which is not in, in breach with the fundamental rights. So uh, this is the position of the EU. And of course, uh, uh, I think it's not, or I, I'm convinced it is not the barrier for cooperating with, with the United States in these fields. Super. I think we're probably running on time. So uh, thank you to you both. And thank you to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.